Dr. Ibrahim Yusuf Gamawa, a historian and a doctor of international relations. We want to thank you so much indeed for joining us here on Control TV to look at some of the political equations that have happened from uh, the First Republic, if you will, and tapering into the Second Republic. How would you describe politics played at that time? Uh, thank you, Gimba. Um, I want to say that politics in the First Republic and that of the Second Republic uh, differ a little. In the sense that in the First Republic, what we had were regional political parties. And during the Second Republic, you know, politics had transformed and Nigeria, you know, at the time was operating a presidential system of government. So at that time, there were national political parties, such as the NPN, PRP, you know, uh, UP and, and other political parties. So politics was entirely different from what obtained in the First Republic, where you had only regional parties, the NPC Action Group, which was the Southwestern political party, and the NCNC, which was more of uh, a Southeastern political party. It was within that time that uh, in Bauchi State we had uh, Alhaji Tatari Ali, who was first governor of Bauchi State at the time. How would you describe his type or style of politics? Was, was there a, for the lack of any word, was there a strategic display or execution, if you will, of the kind of politics he played at the time? Uh, Tatara Ali was the first executive governor of Bauchi State. As you are aware, Bauchi State was created on the 3rd of February 1976 by the Multara regime. So before Tatara Ali, there, were, there had been two military administrators. Bello Kaliel was the first military administrator at the time the state was created. And uh, Garba Duba, also a military man, succeeded uh, Kaliel in 78. So it was the Duba administration that handed over the reins of government to Tatari Ali after he won the 1979 elections. But I want to say that Tatari's emergence as the flag bearer of NPN in Bauchi is similar to Shagari's emergence as the candidate of the NPN at the time. How so? I don't know if you are aware that Shagari didn't actually intend to run for the presidency. He had indicated interest to run for a senatorial position in Sokoto, but somehow ended up as the presidential candidate of the National uh, Party of Nigeria, NPN. This is the same way also in Bauchi at the time, because Tatari Ali was away in Saudi Arabia when the primary elections took place. And it was Adam Mutafa Balewa, who eventually became his deputy, that presented his candidature at the primary elections with a contribution of 10,000 Naira. The major contenders in Bauchi at the time were Yunusa Kaltungo, uh, Sula Kumo, and the late uh, Walim Bauchi, uh, Malam Abu Bakar Umar, of blessed memory. So, Shagari was away when he became the candidate of the party. You seem to have established a nexus from the kind of politics that was played in Bauchi State at that time and at the national level, which saw the emergence of uh, Alhaji Shehu Shagari as the president of Nigeria. Is that what it is? Would anyone be right to say, for instance, that the kind of politics that Tatari Ali played was perhaps what was emulated at the national level. If you go further to uh, inquire or you know, dig into how and why Shagari became the candidate at the time, you will see that, uh, like I told you, it was the Makama Nupe that met a couple of northern elites to say that he thinks Shagari would make a good president. 
because of his experience, because of his uh, maturity, his humility, and so many other qualities that he thought Shagari had possessed that you know, stood him out from other people. It was basically based on that, and he consulted a number of people to convince them that Shagari should be the candidate of the National uh, Party of Nigeria at the time. Shagari also, like Tatari, was a way out of the country. And all the elites at the time agreed that he is a good material for the presidency. Do you think the electoral process in Nigeria can give rise to true democracy, practice to the letter? If you are talking about Nigerians from this part of the country, yes, I can agree with you. Uh, you know why? Because I think that the concept of citizenship confers, you know, every Nigerian the right to seek the presidency, irrespective of where he resides, or where he comes from, or where he was born. So to say that a northerner or the northerners have, you know, uh, been holding power is not true. No one has stopped anybody from any other part of the country to seek the presidency or to run for the presidency if he has the capacity or the ability to win. Most of the times that Northerners were at the helm of the affairs of the, the country or during the military regimes, nobody stopped any Igbo man or Yoruba man from planning a coup. And it was not with the knowledge of Northerners that most of the coups were staged. Me, as an ordinary northerner, had never been part of any plan to overthrow any government. So this is why I, I say I don't agree that. But one thing I can tell you is, even before independence, the northerners were far more politically aware than the rest of the country. This I know. I don't know if you have read the book by Macintosh, where he was saying in that book that he was always amazed when, when there is a meeting at the colonial office in London. When all the regions are going there for a meeting and crucial decisions are being taken about the independence of the country. He said the northern delegates were always, when they arrived the venue, they go by the side with the original governors who were British, you know, brainstorming and taking positions on what to present at the meeting. But the Southwest and Southeastern leaders will be abusing and insulting the, the, their own governors. They had no working relationship, no cooperation completely. So and at the end of the day, after the meeting, the Northern region will t carry the day because they must have articulated positions that you know, the rest of the regions were not prepared for. Is that still continuing today? In a way it is. Plus also you must know that politics is a game of number. The rest of the regions have not been able to integrate themselves well in the country to, to put themselves at an advantage in the game of politics. So the clamor for rotational presidency, power shift, all this, for me, I think it's out of uh, what I would call a political complex. Because if we say this is a democracy, then what are we saying? That power should shift, then what has it become? If in a democracy you are dictating where or who should rule, Many uh, scholars, Afri experts on Africa, think that most African states are not getting it right because they don't pay attention to the important things. For example, instead of focusing on how to rule, you know, the 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 attention on, is on who should rule. 
So we are not looking for leaders, actually. What will it take to change that for us? For example, Mahmoud Mamdani, the author of Saviors and Survivors, was given example in his book. And he's, he's saying that for African governments or states to make any meaningful progress, they must redefine political rights. Because this rotational presidency or power shifts are seen as rights. And in the real sense, they are not. So they need to, there needs to be a good understanding of what a political right is and what is not your right. Rotational presidency or power shift are no rights in, in reality. And he was given example of this in that book by citing the issue of federal character and resource control and all those things. And I argue that citizenship is seen as an abstract thing in, in most of Africa. Because if you are saying that somebody has to come from a place, then you are contradicting the concept of citizenship completely. Where do you think the politics of our country will take us to next in 2023? I think that in 2023, probably, uh, the jinx will be broken about power shift. For me personally, I don't believe that the presidency should be zoned to anybody. Not because I don't want other people from other parts of the country to, to rule the country, no. But I think it is a reality that must be accepted that rotation of the presidency is taking the country nowhere and will further divide the country because this is not something that can stand. But clearly, this is what some groups are asking for. Yeah, I think they are just asking, they don't know the implications because it will lead to further disagreement in the coming years and the coming, each group will be making more demands about when it should rule and when it is their time to rule. And there will be no end to this. At every point we'll be faced with a crisis of who, sh or who or where should the president come from. So it is better to allow uh, political forces to determine that instead of people deciding or political parties zoning. If you have read my book on Nigeria, our destiny is in our own hands. The introduction began with these words that perhaps it is apt to describe uh, the situation in Nigeria to the historical inevitability that Isaiah Berlin's article featured. And I said that two events, you know, justify that. One is the uh, slavery, the transatlantic slave trade that happened and that affected parts of Africa, including Nigeria. It's an inevitable thing that took place. One cannot reverse it. You cannot deny that it happened. You cannot also uh, wish away the suffering, you know, the misery that the African people were forced to go into or undergo. And the second is colonialism. So I, I argued in that part that, in fact, colonialism was even worse. Because what it did was far worse than the slavery. It introduced the Africans into a new economic and political system that they have not been able to understand. Do you think the question of sovereignty, of unity of our country, can be addressed through 
a referendum. If you had still read that book, you will see that I, I spoke in general or wrote in general about the problems facing many African states. I talked about Ali Mazrui's African triple heritage, you know, in trying to find out what the problem is in Africa and in Nigeria. It's the same problem across the con uh, continent. So I came to somehow agree with Robert Jackson, whose theory of negative sovereignty, you know, somehow tried to explain the situation in which many African states have found themselves. So Jackson argues that uh, what many African governments had was a negative sovereignty and that building a state, you know, happens over time and it takes a long time. So, but the expectations of many Africans were that once independence is granted, then all their problems have ended. And it is not true. Is that the beginning of our problems in our country? That is the beginning because in my book I argue that Nigeria has made progress. We are building a country. A country is not built overnight. All the disagreements and everything is part of the process. It's like a child. When he is born, he learns to sit, crawl, walk. He matures in his thinking. And, you know, at 40, 50, he's fully matured. So it's the same thing with states. So there are no quick fix to the problems that we face. Where then do we start from? The attainment of positive sovereignty can only be hastened, but you can't escape it. You can't jump it. It is like, for example, when somebody has a problem and he is not aware that he has a problem. You know, if you, are, you have a problem and you are not aware that you have a problem, then it means that problem cannot be solved. Or well, the likelihood of, being, uh, of it being solved is very slim. But if it is pointed out to you that you have a problem and this is the problem, then there's possibility that the problem can be solved easy, uh, quickly or in time. Dr. Gabawa, tell us what your last final words will be on the unity question as well as the political uh, question in terms of getting it right? You know, uh, in the same book I was telling you about, historically, the southern part of the country has never been united. Within the Niger Delta, all the groups living in that place have never agreed among themselves. The Isekiri sees himself different from the Ogoni or the other person. And so also if you come to the areas of Akwaibo and Kalaba, you know, they never agree with one another. There has been this rivalry and enmity historically between all these groups. So if, for example, now the South secedes, New agitations will begin within the Southeast or South South or wherever by those other groups. Mind you, Nigeria is a country of about 380 something different ethnic nationalities that speak different languages. So within the South also, you have maybe about 100 different groups. So these groups also will begin to clamor and say they've been marginalized by the Ijo, or by the Igbos, or by the Yorubas. If, even within the Yoruba uh, states, they are not united, historically. 
the Ijebu and there is this difference and rivalry among themselves. So, I don't think the division of the country or succession or whatever is the solution to, to this. We are just going to create another problem and then they will realize much later that it was not actually a solution. That's a good place to let it rest. Um, uh, Dr. Ibrahim Yusuf Gamawa, the historian as well as the doctor of international relations. We do sincerely thank you for talking to us here on Control TV.